Okay, so today I'm in Surrey with legend of the betting ring, Johnny Lights. Johnny, so um, so pleased that you've agreed to, to do this interview. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, everybody will know you as Johnny Lights, but your surname is Herndel. So where did your nickname come from? Well, what happened was my dad um, used to be a, a trader, sell bits and pieces. He had a fruit stall and he put all to attract attention he put all lights around the stall and unfortunately when he passed away the name of lights went on to me so, so you you were a well-known face a regular on uk race courses for several years well, decades. So how long were you active on the race course? I first went when I was 18, about roughly 18. Um, I haven't been, unfortunately, December's 14th coming up. It's the anniversary of me not being well for 13 years. I was at the races one day, didn't feel great. Come on. I said to me, my Meg, I don't feel well. We lived in Tankerton, down in Whitstable, in a penthouse that I'd bought from previous sales of where we lived. We sort of moved up. And I didn't feel well. I had a pal down there I fred me with. Megan found him, she said, Pete, Johnny's done not great. Come round, anyway, he came round. As soon as he came in, he said, John, you're not well, mate. He said, I'm going to phone for an ambulance. Phone for an ambulance. Three hours later, I was in Margate Intensive Care fighting sepsis was in there I don't know two or three a good two months um, I eventually thank God came out started to slowly get on my feet again we had a beautiful penthouse overlooking the sea and I started playing again, you know, and eventually I got back to the races. Now, by that time, you know, from being like a prostitute's knickers up and down, I, I got going. And I, I not so much knew what I was doing, but I plonk myself around people that I know they did know what they were doing. Um, I started, I had certain members on the rails that worked for major companies. I finished up friendly with one or two and, you know, they, they were good to me with what they tell me and I tried to pacificate with different things anyway. I started then to find out one or two was hot and as I say I plonked myself around them. Uh, I went from having two or three hundred quid on in about two or three years, I was capable of having 10 or 15 grand on. Um, there was a very strong market. However, eventually, that, for some unknown reason, that the bookmaking became from a strong ring, became a very weak ring. And 
where you could get your whack on and the big hitters could get their whack on it became so weak that a lot of the big players wouldn't go because they couldn't get on and there was a hell of a lot of business went on off course however the introduction of pitches came where you could instead of being wherever you bet in the ring seniority you were able to buy and sell pitches now a lot of people thought at the time that bookmaking if you was a bookmaker you had a license to print money and the race calls pitches were very attractable to people that wanted to be a bookmaker but it wasn't quite the gold mine I thought it was now through inexperience and playing up members who they didn't know was up members plenty went by the wayside and finished up selling back the pitches because they had no more money they'd sell the pitches cheaper than what they give for them um, it became as I say a very very strong ring Scotland there were bookmakers um, you know that would take a big bet in the north the market were very strong there were big players and a round skinny one it was very hard for the firms such as coral seals labbrooks they used to send money back to the course but in the north of england there weren't much point in them sending money back because it was very hard for them to shorten them up and that was the object of the operation major firms had sent money back to the course to try and shorten them up and as i say in the north i found it very difficult because there were such big players and um there was a period where as i say the ring went very slim but the introduction of buying and selling pitches put new life in the ring and i won't say everyone who came bought pitches were didn't know what they were doing but plenty didn't know what they were doing and they quickly got bet up by the op mob the races and that was it I used to go, I wasn't right frightened to travel. If I thought I had a chance somewhere looking at the cards, I'd make, go there. There's a shop in the West End of London, don't know if it's still there, but it used to sell time form for the following couple of days. And you know, I wore a time form addict and it enabled me to find out where I would have a chance. And, I, you know, I got going by then. I were a lot more selective and I knew book bookmakers, some you couldn't get too bob on with, where some were, as I say, very big players. I remember a wonderful story. I went to the me up in the ticket bureau and booking. Uh, a guy phoned me up from Ireland. His name was John Mulhern. He unfortunately passed away later. And he said to me, I booked him in the hotels and Two knees over for Royal Ascot. 
and a couple of times I went out to dinner in the week and he was telling me racing stories, different things and he said to me now Johnny I want you to remember this name he said in Ireland there's a guy very hot and he's coming to England to train horses he said his name is Barney Curley he said and believe me he said you, you don't want to be against him he said invariably he'll be right when he puts it down so there came a time at York funny story I had always had very poor legs I went to an accident I had in 1971 and having such bad legs I had legs like Arkle I, I had to have a wider shoes had to be wider and I found that a shop in Bond Street sold wide fitting but they were crocodile shoes and they weren't cheap but it was at to have them so this particular day Barney had now come over he'd got going he had a couple of real touches he plonked himself between Michael Stout, Cecil and he was a good lead round their horses wasn't always right but invariably he was right a lot more times than he was wrong so came this day at York it was a time where they didn't have to play off course because the ring was so strong you could see what they were doing the hot mob cut a story short Barney came to York Ebor week and surprised to see him there but he was there he plonked himself round because he won a, a fair bet he plonked himself round Whelan, Steve, Leslie Steele, Colin Webster, Stephen Little and the, some big hitters. So once he came in the ring, he couldn't get away from me. It was my business to be on him. To cut a story short, as soon as he come in the ring again, bang, I'll be on him and he couldn't get away from me and one day he turned around to me he said Johnny I want you he said you see those crocodile shoes you wear he said you want to be trading them in for a pair of obnell boots he said you are you'd make a good policeman he said every time I look round you're behind me and I said to him, Barney, please God for you and me that I'm always on your tail. I said, because the day you look round and I ain't there, I said it would be no good for me and no good for you. I like to be round up members, as I say. I didn't see any future being around cold ones. There were some hot merchants, but there was also some imposters that thought they were hot. And, you know, the races was a place where fortunes won and, were won and lost. Uh, as I say, the North then in Scotland, I used to like, Megan and I, we used to go to the main festival with Stark Glen Eagles. And by that time, I became very friendly with a guy called John Goff. 
and for my money in the last 40 years I saw there's two people who jump in, not flat, two people that stood head and shoulders above all others. That was John Boff, and now I've been putty with for many years, Stevie Hamilton. It was no fluke that they were good judges. They put plenty of work in. Stevie uh, Hamilton would be up six in the morning doing the card, it was his business, and he became a very, he worked in the meat market, but eventually he slowly got going and he became a professional gambler at the races. As I say, he was a very good judge, and him and Goffey, for me, were head and shoulders above all the others.